Alrighty, well, tonight we are bringing in Steve Lexen from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and Steve, I don't think really needs much more of an introduction other than, you know, one of the one of the really um, interesting deep thinkers about big processes in, in Southwest archaeology. So we're very happy to have Steve here tonight. And Dr. Lexen, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I was very much looking forward to coming to Tucson and, and Southern Arizona and seeing old friends. I was also looking forward to getting out of Boulder where it was freezing and to someplace nice and warm. <laughs> well, that didn't work out so well. Okay, so we're talking about politics then and now. After doing this for 45, almost 50 years, uh, I sort of came to the conclusion that we've gotten the Southwest wrong for over 100 years. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I was thinking, you know, why'd we, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute here. We got it really wrong. How is that, you know, how did that happen? Are we all stupid? No, I don't think so. So there's something in the way we're trained. I can't tell whether this is good or bad in terms of, okay. That's good. Is that a thumbs up or more, more volume? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, it's how we were trained uh, and the premises that we operate under um, are flawed. And that goes back to the founding of American anthropological archaeology in you know, the late 19th century. I'm not going to get into that here. Um, but in the Southwest in particular, I mean, it, it applies from the Pacific to the Atlantic, and everything that we've done. But in the Southwest, this is really, really, really compounded by the, the, the hold over archaeologists and in our interpretation of what we think the modern Pueblos are like, our vague notions of what Pueblos are all about. And we, we believe that everything in the past had to be something like that or leading to that, logically. I mean, obviously, there's change in the past. If it wasn't change in the past, we wouldn't be doing archaeology. But we, the way we interpret things is all within what I'm calling Pueblo space that starts in Santa Fe <laughs> in the 19-teens. And it's a bunch of white guys. Not a bunch of white guys. It's half a dozen white guys that you know, are the city fathers that make this stuff up. That's Edgar Hewitt. And uh, <clears throat> what was going on was that Santa Fe was nothing, uh, you know, at the turn of the last century, you know, uh, 1900. It was this tiny little town, 5,000 people, um, mud buildings, dirt streets, you know, had a little bit of history, but nobody cared about the history much um, outside of the, the denizens of Santa Fe. Uh, the going concern was Albuquerque, all right? The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad didn't even go to Santa Fe. It went through Albuquerque. Albuquerque had the university. Uh, the state legislature gave Albuquerque the university. They gave Santa Fe the penitentiary. <laughs> okay. Um, Albuquerque was modern. They knocked down their old town. Uh, now they wish they hadn't, but knocked down their old town. They were building modern buildings and streetcars and all that kind of stuff that Santa Fe didn't have. And they had business. That was as much, insofar as there was a business hub in, in New Mexico that was in Albuquerque. And the, the city father of Albuquerque said, why don't we move the capital down here? Makes sense. It's on the railroad. You know, this is where all the action is. And the city fathers of Santa Fe didn't want to do that. You know, that's all they had going for them, is they were the capital, <laughs> for what it was worth, of New Mexico. So they said, well, we can't fight them with industry, and we can't fight them with business. We'll fight them with culture. You know, that's what we'll do, is we'll market Santa Fe. And first they started with Hispanic culture, um, conquistadors, all right? And it, it, this is, there's actually a big literature on this. I mean, I'm telling you, you know, like a just-so story or something, but... There's a big literature on this that archaeologists never read, which is really interesting. Uh, historians, it's written by historians, cultural historians, architectural historians, some cultural anthropologists are involved in this. But archaeologists don't know any of that. Now, wait, I shouldn't say that, but uh, we, we make our graduate students read obscure French philosophers, but we don't make them learn about this. Um, okay, so they, they started with Spanish, um, and nobody's buying. You know, we just fought a war with Spain. Nobody cared about, you know, then there's the black legend, and, you know, we were, which got into the yellow journalism before the run-up to the Spanish War. Um, if people on the East Coast wanted to see Spanish colonial, they just hop on Mr. Flager's train and go down to St. Augustine. And they had a lot more cool Spanish stuff there than they had in Santa Fe. I mean, they had a big castle. If people on the West Coast wanted to see Spanish, they could, you know, drive down and see the, the missions that were being restored at that point. And these, you know, these nice sort of Rococo missions that are, you know, <laughs> a lot nicer than any mission church in New Mexico. So they dropped back 10 yards. I mean, that didn't impress anybody. They dropped back 10 yards and said, we'll do Indians. And they're, you know, they're actually thinking about this. And Hewitt's right in the middle of it all. We'll do Indians. And we'll do archaeology. Uh, we'll do Pueblo Indians, specifically. And we'll market Pueblo Indians. So now, Pueblo starts off as a Spanish colonial administrative term. 
for settled people. You know, it means town, but, but um, in the 17th century, it was also a colonial term for people with a government's polity, people they could deal with, um, as opposed to the Indios Barbaros, who were like the Apaches and Navajos, you know, they, they couldn't stay in one spot, they didn't have a, a chief, they didn't have a government. So it starts off as a Spanish colonial term, Pueblos. Then it gets turned into a faux ethnic label for the Pueblos, which, you know, five different languages, <laughs> 40 different villages that don't get along. And, and, and certainly there's commonalities there, but there is no, you know, there's no Pueblo ethnicity. Um, there's a bunch of different Pueblos, and they each have their own clans and all that kind of stuff. And these guys turn it into a brand. So it goes from being an administrative term, colonial term, to a faux, you know, anthropological term, to a brand. And it worked. Who's been to Santa Fe? And who, who says it works? <laughs> it worked. It worked. I mean, you know, it, it, it kept the, uh, the capital in Santa Fe, but then, the, you know, then the artists came, and then, you know, it, when, when all this stuff comes out, the, of Pueblo Mystique comes out, um, gets in the papers, the artists show up, and, and, you know, eventually you got the Santa Fe you got today, which is like a theme park. Um, nice place to visit. I lived there twice, and wouldn't want to do it again. So it wasn't just Hewitt. I mean, once it takes off, you know, once we start elevating this, this mythologized Pueblo, um, sort of Zen gardener thing, uh, lots of people contribute to it. Architects and anthropologists, for sure. Uh, Ruth Benedict, uh, the, the railroad, Fred Harvey and his people, artists, uh, writers, whatever. They all, they all jump on board, and they really love it. Yeah, and it's, it's not so much, you know, they like going out looking at the Pueblos, but you, you don't learn a lot from looking at the Pueblos because the Pueblo people don't really want to talk about what they do to folks like this. So we came up with this, which is a distillation of a whole lot of hooey I read when I was writing this book. Um, our notion of Pueblo, I call it Pueblo space. And, uh, it was Pueblo mystique back in the, in the beginnings. Uh, but there was also a Maya mystique in archaeology that had the same problems that, that this stuff is causing us. So I'm calling it Pueblo space because it's, it's the space within which art, Southwest archaeology operates. You know, it's the limits of polite discourse. Um, if you get outside of Pueblo space, you get your hand slapped. Uh, this hand, right here, many times. Um, they're local. They're small scale. They're small, independent farming villages, sort of utopian little places. They're egalitarian and communal, um, peaceful and spiritual, which I'm sure Pueblo people are when they can be. Um, I mean, Pueblo people were pretty well known for going out with the Spanish and chasing Navajos around. <laughs> I mean, they, they're, they have a, a practical, you know, their history involves a lot of very practical politics. And eternal, this is the other thing, eternal and unchanging. It's always been this way. And this is the, the hype. This is the brand. That archae and arch to think that it doesn't affect archaeology is naive. Of course it affects archaeology. I mean, we all grew up with this. Um, and again, you know, it's very difficult to actually know the Pueblos. Uh, um, you know, I know lots of Pueblo people, but I wouldn't claim to know what goes on in Pueblos. But this is the kind of general um, abstract, um, stere you know, stereotypes are a bad word, mythologized uh, Pueblos that it pervades archaeology. And you don't have to take my word for it, uh, but it does. Um, yeah, OK, so it, it's wrong. <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, oh, yeah, OK, the important thing is that uh, the past had to be this way, too. It's eternal and unchanging, you know, OK? And all this stuff is cooked, getting cooked up right after World War I, which in this country, you know, a lot of young men got killed. But it didn't mess this country up the way that it messed up Europe. I and mean, World War I was just horrible for Europe. And a lot of the intellectuals, you know, fled Europe and came over here and told us how horrible it was. Um, this really appealed to folks, both in the old world and the new, after World War I and the, the influenza and all that stuff. And uh, uh, Curtis Hensley, who's a historian who's actually written about this, uh, calls it... Um, Stasis is therapy. <laughs> it was nice to think that there's one little chunk of North America where nothing ever changed. You know, and it was calm and peaceful. And, you know, it, it's really utopian. You know, these utopian Zen gardeners living in little bitty villages, and when they aren't praying, they're playing flutes or whatever. <laughs> but it doesn't work in prehistory. Let's start with Chaco. Um, I mentioned I just uh, wrote my last book. I think it'll be out in about a year, uh, maybe less. Just in time for Christmas next year, so remember that. Um, and I use Chaco as an example in that book because everybody knows about Chaco. Well, at Chaco, you had a class society, and it's really, really obvious. And it's been obvious. We've known this since the 30s when they, when they de determined that one side of the canyon, you got half a dozen of these really big great houses, and really 
big, great houses. And the other side of the canyon, you got normal family houses. These are the kind of houses that everybody's living in in the 11th century, except for the people that live in those. <laughs> and all you have to do is walk through Pueblo Benito and then walk across the bridge, across the canyon, and walk through what they call the BC sites, which are the single family houses, um, sometimes uh, arranged in lines. And if you don't recognize that there's one class of people living there and another class of people living here, if you're an archaeologist anyway, you ought to turn in your trowel. And it's really, really obvious. We've tried everything under the sun to make it go away. I mean, I've, ta I've taken archaeologists from France, Italy, England, of course, Mexico, of course, Japan. I've either taken them out there or described this situation, and they said, well, you know, it's obvious. You've got a class society. You've got, you know, 5% of the people living in these things and 95% of the people living in, like, everybody else is living out there. And that's not how, that, that doesn't fit in Pueblo space. Nor does this, that Chaco Canyon itself is a capital city of a region the size of Indiana with 150 little um, triangles and circles and squares and stuff. Our smaller great houses, they're like a 20th of Palo Benito, picked up in a giant helicopter and dropped in the middle of a community of those little single family houses for the secondary nobility or whatever. And we know it's a region because there's things we call roads, these long linear um, earthen monuments which people travel in. Um, which, unfortunately, uh, the ones that are on there, <laughs> there are many, 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 we know there are many, many, many more of them. But it hasn't been researched since the 80s. In the 80s, BLM, Bureau of Land Management, threw a bunch of money at the roads. And that's most of where those red lines are. Nobody's spent that kind of money or time since then. But every time we go out to map some little great house here, there's a, there's a road segment pointing off. So yeah, they're there, but they won't be in about 10 years because they're going to frack the heck out of the San Juan Basin. I mean, it's really, it, it, this is one of the, coolest sort of fossilized political systems on the planet, archaeological political systems on the planet, and it's going to, you know, the roads, which are really important to understanding how it works, I mean, it's the structure of the thing, they're going to, going to be gone. We're not going to be able to study them. And there's also line of sight signaling systems, all kinds of things that, yeah, Chaco was the center of that. That does not fit in Pueblo space, but that is, those are facts I'm giving you. I mean, these are facts. And it doesn't fit in Pueblo space. The past was different. And for 100 years, we haven't let the past be different in any way that would not lead to a, logically to a Pueblo. And it's, it's really how we screwed up. Um, I gave this, uh, not this same talk at all, but, but those arguments up at ASU, um, Arizona State University, last night. And yeah, people were going, hmm, hmm. <laughs> Maybe we screwed up. So Chaco was none of this, all right? It wasn't local. It was, you know, Chocolo as a polity was the size of in, in, uh, Indiana. Um, it wasn't, you know, the settlements weren't independent. I mean, they're, they're all linked together by roads and line of sight networks, and they have a, somebody in the middle calling the shots. Certainly not egalitarian, not communal. I mean, it's a class society with nobles and commoners, which, by the way, um, there were nobles and commoners from California to Florida uh, and all the way down to Panama. Um, in the 11th century. In society, those kinds of societies, those were the rule for Chaco to not have nobles and commoners is the exception, which would, would, would be truly exceptional. Within Pueblo space, though, you say nobles and commoners is treated like an extraordinary claim. It's not. If you know anything about North America in the 11th century, it's, you know, that's what people were doing. That's what societies were like. Um, it was peaceful most of the time, except when it wasn't. <laughs> um, it was peaceful. Chaco did its job, uh, but one way it did its job was enforcing the peace, and every once in a while there would be these brutal incidents where they'd round up, they'd go out to some village and round up every man, woman, and child and chop them to chutney. I mean, uh, it, it, not many times, but you didn't have to do that very often. Um, spiritual? Who knows? I mean, uh, <laughs> another one of my gripes with Southwestern archaeology at this point is that they went mad for ritual in the 90s. And, you know, I sit there at meetings and hear these astonishing cosmological assertions based on nothing, you know, on a wing and a prayer. I'm sure, yeah, of course they had religion and that kind of stuff, but we don't know much about it. It was very different than what Pueblo people do. I mean, you can see that in the archaeology. That at 1300, there's a big shift in, in iconography and, and, you know, the, arch the ceremonial architecture, all that kind of stuff. It's like a, a watershed. So we can say it changed, but we, you know, the archaeologists can't say what was going on back then. And eternal unchanging, no, forget it. That's a, that's a non-starter. Okay, so the other place I think about, um, <laughs> excuse me just a second here. The other place I think about these days, because uh, somebody's paying me to think about it, is Membris. But also because that's where I've done a lot of work. That was my last field projects, weren't it? 
fucking charcoal. <clears throat> They're down southern New Mexico. And so I was thinking, okay, what does this do to members? Um, it, it, <laughs> the main thing I'll talk about um, is that members' villages and members' archaeology is considered to be absolutely local and independent and small scale, small scale, small scale, small scale. Um, which, you know, our day-to-day -day life certainly was. I mean, the, the, the scale of farming was small, but to understand members' history, which is what this is all about, nah, it was big. Um, okay, so members' archaeology um, starts in the 19-teens, and uh, a guy in the town of Deming, who was a casual pot hunter, sent uh, pictures of members' pots to the Smithsonian, Smithsonian sent out an archaeologist, he bought the pots. That was the end of the story. <laughs> yeah, everybody went, you know, this isn't just a wacky hobby, from, you know, picking curios. I can actually make money doing this. And that's been a sad story for members ever since. Um, most of the sites got hand pot hunted, uh, which leaves a... Is that yeah. Okay. Is it working now? I think so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, well, fast forward here. Um, uh, you, Archaeologists up in Santa Fe wrote members off in the after about 1920. They said, you know, it's gone. You're not going to learn anything down there. And they, they had all the pots they wanted too. Every museum wanted those pots. Um, not this, not this pot, but <laughs> the black and white pots. I'll show you in a minute. Um, and <clears throat> it was basically left alone until the 1970s when outsiders came in and the guys in Santa Fe, who are usually pretty protective of the archaeology in New Mexico, said, yeah, fine, you can come in. You're not going to find anything down there anyway. So there's an outfit from Texas that worked there, uh, uh, Harry Schaefer, uh, an outfit from California with Steve LeBlanc, an, outwork, uh, an outfit from Michigan was led by Art Jelinek um, initially, uh, that eventually I got involved with um, down there, that were trying to rescue what they could out of members' archaeology, and it turns out you can learn a lot. Uh, members starts off with uh, pit houses with ramp entries and red on brown pottery. And if that pit house was a little higher and this was a little more buffer, it would be like a Hohokam house and like Hohokam pottery. Uh, and people have noticed that. That's not a, you know, a novel observation. Uh, Emil Howery noticed that uh, years ago, that members you know, had a lot going on with, with early members. Uh, this would be you know, eight, 750, something like that, or 600, something like that. Um, had a lot to do with Hohokam to the west, because um, Hohokam was going strong from 600 to about 1000 AD. So over in members, you, you find stuff that you would consider Hohokam, like cremations. Not everybody was cremated, but a lot of people were cremated, um, which did, wasn't happening up north at that time. By up north, I mean Chaco and Mesa Verde. They, you know, they didn't do that sort of thing. And you find uh, pallets that are not this big, they're that big. Um, there are members' versions of these Hohokam pallets that, that seem to be associated with the cremation rituals, whatever that is. And the, the glycemerous shell, uh, we call them bracelets, but um, we actually don't want members where they wore them, and it's on the upper arm, <laughs> which uh, some Hohokam archaeologists call those a badge of being Hohokam. If you wear that, then you're Hohokam. Well, the members are wearing them in, in quantity uh, because they often buried people. I mean, they cremated a lot of folks, but they mostly buried people. Uh, we actually see where, you know, where these things are, and some people have like you know, 30 of them on one arm. It's really quite amazing. Um, so this is still early members. This, you know, this would be pushing 700s at this point, where they're paying a lot of. T I mean, they're doing their own thing, but they're paying a lot of attention to what's going on over in the Phoenix Basin in Tucson. And you know, probably most importantly of all, is, is irrigation. Um, this is a canal, uh, a members canal. All right. Now, Chaco never really got into canals in a big way, or Mesa Verde never got into canals in a big way, but Holcomb did. You all know that. Uh, Holcomb was. You know, they invented the thing up here. Um, and so when members, uh, which is down in the Sonor uh, Chihuahuan Desert, not the Sonoran Desert, if they wanted to farm, they had to irrigate. It doesn't rain enough. So you live along a nice creek like the Members River. If you can get the water to your fields, you do just fine. And they did just fine. But to, to learn the technology, they didn't have to make it up. And there's people who have been doing it for a thousand years just across the state line. And there wasn't a state line then. <laughs> okay. So they're, they're coasting along, looking like themselves, but also paying a lot of attention to Hohokam because that's what you know, Hohokam is big at that point. Until sometime around 1000 AD, they decide they're not going to live in those pit houses with ramp entry entryways anymore, and they're not going to make that red on brown, which could be red on buff pottery anymore, and they're not going to do the cremations. And, well, they, they keep doing some cremations. But like, they wake up one morning, and I believe it was on May 12th in the year, <laughs> not actually 1000, you know, 988, something like that. And so we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to build Pueblos. 
Stone Pueblos, above ground Pueblos, the same site. This is, what is this? Cameron Creek, uh, one of the sites that got excavated um, before all the destruction from the pot hunting. And um, it looks like, you know, it's just boom, overnight, they, they decide we're going to not make that kind of pottery anymore. We're not going to live in those pit houses. We're going to live in stone pueblos and make that fancy black and white pottery that everybody likes so much. That was the opinion of Emil Howery, who I'm sure some of you might know, uh, who's the, the guy that defined the Mugion of which members is a part. He defined that back in the 30s. And Howery insisted that these guys were Mugion, whatever that meant, um, until 1000 AD. And then when they made the shift, that it wasn't, you know, it was really difficult to not think about them as being part of what's to the north, Anasazi, uh, in, the, in the terms of that time. It's what we call Ancestral Pueblo now, but I'll, I'll say Anasazi because it's, that's historically what they were talking about. That he, he said after 1000 AD, you know, you can't understand stone pueblos in black and white unless you look at all the people up there that are making stone pueblos in black and white pottery. <laughs> and he, he believed that to his dying day. Um, I knew him late in life, and we go over and talk about this, and he would just shake his head at what happened in the 70s when those guys from Texas and California and Michigan showed up, the young youngsters. They decided that everything is local there, and they did marvelous work. Okay, I'm going to dump on one aspect of this, but, but uh, Stephen Blanc's work and his people's work um, and Harry Schaefer's work uh, with the Nan Ranch um, was really, you know, it told us what we, all we really know about members at this point, which is a lot. Um, they looked at the pottery, and there were other people involved in this, and they had, came up with a synoptic series, which is a logical series of how you get from A to B to C to D. And you start off with the red on brown, red on buff, whatever, and you put a white slip under that, it becomes red on white, and it's three circle red on white. And then you change the paint so it's black, so you get the black on white, and then it's hop, skip, and a jump up to that, well, I didn't put a picture pot up there, but uh, up to the famous members black and white pottery. But, um, it's not a stratigraphic series, it's a synoptic series, and it seemed to work for them. And it, uh, after the 70s, the party line became that members had nothing to do with the North. The Howry was wrong. Yeah, people accepted that you remember early member stuff uh, that you know had something to do with Hoacom, but there was no connection between this and Chaco, or, or you know, between members in Chaco, or members in the Anasazi, or members in the Ancestral Pueblo, which is very peculiar. <laughs> so you got all those people up there making stone pueblos and black and white pottery. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure what, what's gained by by uh, cordon, uh, uh, um, chopping these guys off and you know saying they're not part of that world. And obviously, I'm going to disagree with that. But it has to do with Pueblo space, in part, that, that uh, the historical dynamics are small. It's all, it's all contained and small. And, you know, chalk was a long way away. So everybody's okay with this? That, and this makes perfect sense, and there's archaeology behind it. This is the stuff that you find in the pit houses. This is the stuff you find in the Pueblos. Um, part of the problem, stratigraphically finding this, is that all the sites are turned upside down by the pot hunters. The synoptic series makes sense. That's what it's supposed to do. It's logical. Um, there's actually disjunctures, if you want to call it that, that these two guys aren't sequential. They show up at the same time. The red on white and the red on black show up at the same time. This is really clear over in the Gila, where I worked, and not so clear, I guess, in the members. Um, and then at 1,000, you go from these designs that really kind of continue the old Hoacom layouts and styles. I mean, you could find something like that on a Hoacom. I've seen stuff like that on, on, on Hoacom. To a whole new artistic tradition. There's a woman named uh, Dorothy uh, Washburn who looked at the symmetries on these things, which is a really good way to get into designs. Uh, you know, you can do the art history stuff with motifs and elements and stuff like that, but you look how they lay it out, which is, you know, how they actually structure what's on the pot. And, and if you see the member stuff, it's all about geometrical structures. And she sees a huge break at 1,000, where the, the symmetries are, they totally switch and they look more northern. Um, that's not to say these pots are made to the north or somebody from the north came down and did it, but it just means, they're, in my thinking, it means they're part of that world where all the stone pueblos and black and white pottery were. And there's, there's archaeology to back it up, too, that up north at this time, at 1000 AD, when they make this switch, this is a regular family house, like the ones I was talking about in Chaco, where, you know, it's not the great house. This is where the normal people live. It's five rooms in what we call a kiva. You know, five rooms in a kiva. It's like a rubber stamp. Um, they're, they're, they, in fact, it's so um, repetitive, they call it a unit Pueblo. It's, this is the unit. It's five rooms in the Kiva, five rooms in the Kiva. Well, over on the Gila, the members start doing that too. 
Now they're they're there are five rooms and a square kiva instead of five rooms and a round kiva. I mean, it's their own deal, but it, uh, the architectural pattern, the architectural layout is, is the same. It's hard to see that in the, the big sites in the Membrus because, they're, again, they're all chewed up. And so you know, putting together how one big site grew is a real challenge. But my guess is that they're, the, the big sites in the Membrus and their big sites in the, in the Gila, too, start as individual family houses and then infill. They, you know, that they, they add rooms, they add rooms, they add rooms, and you wind up with something that looks sort of like tiles. Um, so, you know, the archaeology is there. Um, there's a couple of ceramic things. I'm, I'm almost done here. But <laughs> this is why I had the PowerPoint, because you need to see this one. <laughs> I can describe it. It won't make any sense at all. A couple of One nice thing about working in a museum is that you see pots from different angles. Like, I walk down the, the row of, there we thank you, of... Uh, uh, I remember stuff, and I'm looking at the sides of the pots. I'm not looking down in them, in, you know, straight down in them. And the sides of the pots aren't, the outside of the bowls um, aren't terribly impressive. They didn't spend a lot of time on them. They just basically smooth them off and not even very smooth. And then, uh, you know, they're putting all their energy to the interior, and not just the energy, but the, the kale and clay that makes the slip, where this, that's the color that the clay fires, is this sort of brownish, grayish brown. Well, they want a nice white canvas to paint on. So you get kale and clay, and this is uh, uh, Paul and Laurel Thornburg, who some of you may know, uh, they used to live south of town here, make really good replications of this stuff, and they started with members. And they said, this is how this works. You get this kale and clay, and you know, pretty runny, and you put it, you dump some in there, and you swirl it around, swirl it around, swirl it around until it's evenly coated, and in the process, some of it goes over the rim. And it's, this is a technical term. I'm not making this up. It's slip slop. <laughs> okay, so I'm walking down the members, uh, you know, shelves and seeing slip slop. And I've seen that somewhere else. And I go over to the Chaco shelves and I'm seeing slip slop. All right, that's the only place that you know. Then I started walking up and down all the shelves, and the only place. And you know, being facetious here, but I, you know, I, I called around, and looked at books and all that kind of stuff. The only place in the Southwest that does this are members of Chaco, which are exactly contemporary, and I think knew all about each other. You, to the point of, of even making pots the same way. What's in the pot, you can see, is very, very, uh, the design in the pot is very, very different. And, and Dorothy Washburn would say, yeah, the symmetries are totally different, but the technologies are the same. And it's really interesting, because nobody else does this. Um, and, you know, all the painted pottery in, in, uh, in the Southwest is those two places. The place that has the big stone pueblos and black and white pottery, Jocko and Membrus, which is trying to have big stone pueblos and black and white pottery. Then, you know, not all the pottery in the, in the museum is painted, <laughs> although we, we heavily favor painted pottery in our museums. Uh, we also have some of the, the, what we call undecorated stuff, which is really decorated um, for both members in Chaco. And look, you know, I'm walking down the, the aisles and seeing indented corrugated uh, for Chaco and Mesa Verde. And this is not just a Chaco, but all over the Anasazi area, they have indented corrugated, where each of those uh, lines is a coil they're coiling it up, and when they're coiling it, they're pinching it and making it look almost like a basket. And some of the stuff is really beautiful. It's not undecorated. Somebody put a lot of work in many of these pots where they actually space it out and make designs and all that kind of stuff. It's really, really pretty and, and also very hard to do. Um, talking to potters, it'd be a lot easier just to have a plain surface. You know, a lot easier just to, you know, coil it up and then wipe it down. You're done, right? So, you know, there's a lot of thought going into it. It's very purposeful. And nobody else does it in the world. I mean, I mean, emailed around. And in the old world, everybody gets the wheel. Of course, they're not going to do this. But in places that do coiling, you don't see anything like this except at members. <laughs> I mean, it's a really specific sort of thing, really eye-catching sort of thing. And it's a, not just a Chaco, but Chaco, Mesa Verde, and the you know, whole four corners. And down in members country. OK? Indented corrugated. And uh, there's lots of it. I mean, this is, this is the utility where after uh, 1000 AD. It's indented corrugated in both places. And that's another strange thing, is that I don't think that's independent invention, <laughs> even though the two are you know, a couple hundred miles apart. Working over on the Gila, I worked on the Gila, and then I worked on one member site in the lower Members Valley. I never worked in the Members Valley itself. In the Members Valley, you have about a dozen medium-sized villages. It's a really nice valley. You know, the creeks are just big enough to do you some good, and not so big that it's a real nuisance to, you know, to canal irrigation. And the heel is a big river. It's a lot rougher to, to deal with. Um, so there, the sites on the Gila are um, fewer in number, but much larger in size. This is Woodrow Ruin, where Jacob Seedig did his dissertation work a few years ago, and I was out there helping. 
Um, so you'll have to take my word for it that everything within that polygon, which is a, a fence, is pretty much architecture. And a couple of great kivas that you see, they're the two round things. Um, and in the middle of it is one room block that sticks up and where most members, you know, they, they did wonderful art, but their architecture is kind of regrettable. Um, not too many right angles and not too many wall, the opposite walls have the same dimensions. <laughs> you know, it's, they're doing the best they can. But there's, there's a room block in the middle of it where, yeah, big, big rooms and big wide walls and probably two stories. And it's like one of those, those dots I showed you on the Chaco map. That's what those dots are, is a big bump in the middle of a bunch of little bumps. That's how you see them before they're excavated. I think that's going on here too, and we got roads. We got roads. So I'm not saying that members was Chaco, you know, that Chaco was ca calling the shots down there. I'm saying that you probably won't understand members if we, if within Pueblo space as some local phenomenon unless you know about Chaco. That's part of that world. In fact, it was kind of a changing artist. I mean, it starts off as sort of hillbilly hoacom, and then about a thousand, it becomes low church Chaco. I, I know I'm not going to get into this, but after members, about 1150, that pottery with all that busy um, art goes away. It's like somebody throws a switch. And it's place they, make, they use, they don't even make it. They use um, a black burnished bowl interior where it's, it's intentionally black and very highly polished. It's almost like an anti-design. You look into it and you almost see your face. All right? They go from all that art to anti-art. <laughs> and then after that, it's pretty clear the members moves down into uh, uh, northern Chihuahua and becomes part of the base population for Casas Grandes. But um, none of this is going to work in Pueblo space. I mean, I, I write books like this, and my colleagues and people that are used to our old view of, of Pueblo space, they, they can't handle this, and they can't handle the truth. And I, I think that's it. Okay, so now we're, if we have the house lights up, you can tell me I'm wrong. And, but we won't record that. I think so, but... Um, as terribly understudied members, we, we pay all our attention is drawn to the decorations, the, the you know, design, and the technology, like that slip slop thing. I mean, that should have been evident to people for years. And as far as I know, I'm the first person to ever notice it. Well, I'm probably not the first person to ever notice it, but the first person to ever point it out and say, hey, this probably means something. So we haven't done a lot with members' technology. We've done uh, with the techniques of making pots. Uh, they've done a lot of work with uh, sourcing them with neutron activation analysis. Daryl Creel and all, all these people involved with members have done amazing work with that. And it's interesting because early on in the pit house period, there are more pots coming from the Gila to the members. And then when they, they get out of the pit houses and start building the, the, the Pueblos and making the black and white pottery, there's more pots coming from the members to the Gila, which is apparently a very strong pattern. I'm not too involved in that work, but sir. It's more complicated than we'd like to think. Uh, Harry Schaefer, who dug uh, Spent years digging the Nan, Nan is N-A-N, it was the brand of the uh, ranch. The Nan Ranch ruin is on private land, and he had many burials. Uh, and because it's on private land, he did some things that we probably wouldn't be able to do on, on sites that are on public land. He did DNA analysis, okay? And he had one woman who was buried, as most members people were, tucked up under the floor with a pot over her head. He had one woman from West Mexico. <laughs> He didn't identify any, anybody from the north, and all the other work that's been done is not DNA work. Uh, it's looking at teeth, it's looking at measurements on your skull that are, are um, genetic. And members looks more like people in Chihuahua than it does like people to the north. Okay, so I, I think that's because members moves to the Chihuahua eventually. So you know, the statistics are going to make that, yeah, they're going to look like Chihuahua people. Um, I don't think there's huge influxes of people. Uh, you know, Howard talked about Anasazi swamping. The Anasazi are spilling off the plateau and swamping these guys. I think what's spilling off the plateau and swamping these guys is the political system of Chaco. That they're on the fringes of that political, because it, it members acts like a weather vane. When Hoacom is really strong, they look to the west. And then about a thousand, you know, quit using the ball courts, Hoacom falls back in on Phoenix. It, it's on the decline. Chaco's on the rise. While Hoacom is waning, Chaco's waxing, and, and the members weathering goes, boom, you know, we'll pay attention to this now. Um, I, I don't think anybody from Chaco is coming down and saying, you know, do this now. Uh, but they're looking at Chaco going, I think we'll do that now. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, Chaco has all these macaws and copper bells and stuff like that. And members had 
macaws and copper bells and stuff like that. And they were clearly tied into whatever Chaco was tied into. Um, at Chaco at this point, I mean, they have uh, cacao. This is uh, Patty Crown's work. I don't think anybody's done the residue analysis on Membris to see if they got the whole package or not, but I wouldn't, it would not surprise me if they had the cacao and stuff like that. So um, they clearly are tied into all directions. I mean, there's a lot of Hoacom stuff early. Um, there is not much exchange of pottery, though. And this is interesting. The members pottery that we like so much, you're probably here tonight because you like that pottery, right? I mean, you, you sort of seen pictures of it, or t you know, it's on t-shirts. You can't swing a cat in a Santa Fe gift shop without hitting something that's got members on it. I mean, if we looked around, somebody's probably got members earrings or members handbag or something. Um, we like that stuff a lot, and it, to the extent that we destroyed most of the members' archaeology getting it for art museums. Nobody else liked it at the time in the 11th century. That stuff does not travel, the picture stuff does not travel outside the members area. Uh, there is zero members at Chaco, and Chaco could have anything it wanted. If it, you know, if it wanted members, it could have members. Um, in the pit house period, uh, stuff that doesn't have figures on it, you see a lot of that in the Hoacom area early. But when they start doing that really fancy art, you know, that's members. I think you have to be a members person to want that. Uh, you know, we, there's lots of cute little bugs and dancing people and stuff. And then there's a bowl with some guy taking somebody else's head off, right? I think all that art, even the stuff that looks cute and funny to us, is ideologically charged where you had to be part of that culture to want to eat your Wheaties out of that, you know? <laughs> and, and the people that weren't part of that, I mean, that, that's a, a, an indication that, no, they weren't part of Chaco in that sense, and Chaco wasn't, you know, part of them, uh, but they are part of that same world, but ideologically they're on two different planets. I'm not a, a big rock art guy. My understanding here, and I, there are probably people in the room that could answer that question better than me, but um, members rock art is pretty, um, unique's a wrong, bad word, identifiable compared to like Holocom rock art or Anasazi rock art that you, you do have members rock art in the same style as the, that pottery. Um, oddly enough, it's most of it, the rock art is not in the members <laughs> valley. <laughs> um, you know, there's a huge members style rock art site that's over in the Jornada de Muerto, you know, on the uh, east of the Rio Grande. Um, there's plenty of rock art in, you know, in the members valley in, in that style and you don't see that style up north, you don't see that style to the west. Of course, there's, you know, the simple things, there's shared, lots of shared motifs and, you know, these sort of universal things, spirals and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I may be wrong about this, but I think the rock art, the people actually know rock art would, would say that no members is a distinct style. Just like members black and white, the decoration is a distinct style. You know, it doesn't grade into chalk or anything like that. Um, the question is uh, about the kill hole, the hole that you often see in the bottom of a member's bowl, which tells you that that bowl was used in a burial because what happens is you know they, they bury you under the floor, put a bowl upside down over your head and then pop a, a hole out of the bottom of it. To my knowledge that doesn't happen up north, doesn't happen to the west. Uh, there are traditions even in Pueblos today of destroying stuff you know when someone is buried. Um, I remember visiting Acoma and talking to somebody from Acoma and there's a cemetery there and they say well yeah we used to come out and smash and they would bring the pots from that person wouldn't put them in the burial because the, the priest wouldn't let them, but, but they'd smash, there was a big pile of smashed pots. So there is a tradition of decommissioning stuff, but not that very specific members way that I'm, that I'm aware of anyway. Now the question's about Chaco Canyon, <clears throat> and I'm saying it's a class stratified society, and the question is how does that work with the other interpretations that say that place is a, like a pilgrimage, well, I'm gonna put words in your mouth, but it was, was periodically occupied and was a pilgrimage center. Well. The Pilgrimage Center fits in Pueblo space. We go around Robin Hood's, I could go into this for hours. We go all around Robin Hood's barn trying to make Pueblo Benito go away. <laughs> it was permanently occupied. Yeah, and it, and it may be a pilgrimage center. I have no idea. I mean, that would be fine with me, but there are people, there's a lot of people that died there that are buried there, and there's every evidence of, you know, full, full-time occupation. Pueblo Benito has, you know, 500 rooms or something, but probably only 20 families. Based on, you know, that's in, uh, independently arrived at by several different archaeologists. But they were very important families. <laughs> they had a lot bigger houses than other folks. That's, that's a noble class. You know, they have big warehouses attached to their, to their um, domain where they store stuff. And so, yeah, you know, Pueblo Benito isn't a teeming Pueblo village. and That would fit in Pueblo space. And there are archaeologists who are trying to turn it back into that, and it wasn't. It was, you know, great big monumental building, very expensive by the standards of the time, occupied by a score or less of noble families. And ooh, they probably had a place in the country too, you know, nobles like that. But. 
is there is there members pottery to the south in Chihuahua? And the answer is yes. I mean, there are big member sites with lots of members pottery all up the, not all up the Rio Casas Grandes, but well up the Rio Casas Grandes. Um, when you see maps of the members region, <laughs> You know, after they get past members is only members in the members valley, which they got past pretty quick. But it'll it'll be all of southwest New Mexico and then a lobe that goes way down in Chihuahua. And you know, they certainly knew the future site of Casas Grandes. Um, again, there's there's many indications, you know, from physical anthropology. The art historians think that the pottery at Casas Grandes, you know, it's not black and white pottery and it doesn't look like members, but they see continuities and themes and motifs and stuff, stuff I don't know how you do that. But I'm pretty happy with having members being a big part. You got 5,000 members people. And at 1,200, you don't have 5,000 members people anymore. They went somewhere. Where'd they go? Well, what pops up at 12, you know, 1,200? Huh, Casas Grandes. <laughs> so it works. Um, but it's a long way away. And you know, that's another one where it doesn't fit Pueblo space. Even though Pueblos are all about migration and stuff, that doesn't fit Pueblo space. You know, it's, it's too big of a historical dynamic. So that's an uphill battle. Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, given all the connections with Mexico and Mesoamerica, where they had forms of writing, <clears throat> why wasn't there writing up north? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure there was record keeping, you know, tallying, and you know, they had geometry and arithmetic and that kind of stuff. And for Chaco, I'm, I'm going away from members back to Chaco. That one of the things the most that's really compelling about Chaco being a capital city in the middle of a region is this line of sight signaling stuff. All right, that you know, from where I worked in Chimney Rock and, and Pagosa Springs, and if you haven't been to Chimney Rock, you should go. Um, it's really one of the coolest sites in the Southwest. It's now a national monument. They had a big firebox up there, about the size of your your kid's sandbox. It was bright red, and you know they weren't toasting marshmallows on it. And Chimney Rock's up on this, it's a thousand feet above the river on this cuesta, um, you know, this knife edge ridge, and they put it there. In part, because there's some archaeoastronomy that goes on with chimney rock, which is you know a pair of rocks that the moon does strange things to. But also, from that spot and only from that spot, you can look down the Piedra River and see Huérfano Mesa. Huérfano Mesa is this very distinctive feature you know, sacred to the Navajo people and sacred to some Pueblo people. In the northern San Juan Basin, you can see from everywhere in the San Juan Basin, including Chaco. You get up on Huérfano, and there's no villages or anything around it, but there are these big fireboxes, just like the one in Chimney Rock. We dug Pueblo Alto, which is the... the Chaco site that can see Huérfano, and there's big fireboxes. So there's a signaling system, and this is pretty well established at this point. My guess is it's more than a yes-no, that we know, you know, that the, all the stuff from the John Wayne movies where the Indians are saying, you know, General Custer with two-thirds of the 7th Cavalry and five troops, you know, all, sending all this detailed information with smoke, they did that. <laughs> they did that. I mean, they, they figured out ways with smoke and fire to transmit information, encoded information, it was complicated, more complicated than yes, no, than the binary, over distance. And, you know, that's writing. That's writing. It's just done with smoke and mirrors. Okay? <laughs> it's not on paper. But I, that's what, to my mind, that's a, it's just a step away from, you know, if, if you transferred that to some permanent medium, or even a temporary medium, that would be writing. But as far as we know, they, you know there was no system of writing. I mean, it could be that we're not, not seeing it. You know, it's on, on media that we, we don't, Recover, um, and don't get me started on this. So I, where'd you get me started on this? <laughs> this is cool stuff. <laughs> Last week, I was, uh, two weeks ago, excuse me, I was at the Southeast Archaeological Meetings in Tulsa, Oklahoma. First time I've ever been to that regional conference. I've been a member of the organization for years, and I you know, never went to the conference, but I went there because I wanted to see a site near Tulsa called Spiro Mounds which is sort of the westernmost big Mississippian site, exactly the same time as Chaco and, and, and members, okay? And I you know, took a tour around Spiro Mounds uh, with a guy named Jim Brown who knows more about that site than anybody else. Um, and he said, well, we have the only piece of lace cloth in North America at Spiro Mounds. Really? I mean, who here has seen the, the, the Tonto shirt? Yeah, okay. You have it here, all right? <laughs> and there's pictures on the members' pots of guys wearing those things. You can tell it's lace work. I mean, you, it's not, you can't tell because it's a painting, but, but it, it, it's not a stretch to say that it's lace work. Um, and you get it at Chaco, okay? There's no Holcom objects at Chaco, even though they're going at exactly the same time. It's, you know, why are there no Holcom objects? You know, why is there no Holcom pottery? Because, you know, Chaco didn't want Holcom pottery. Well, you know, they had their own pottery. 
but you know, almost unknown from Pueblo Benito, no, excuse me, from Chetra Kettle, which is one of the big great houses there, there's a Hohokam shirt, or a piece of Hohokam fabric of that same lace work, cotton, um, which you go on the Maxwell Museum website, and this must be Dave Phillips, who's the guy who was in charge of Maxwell for so long, he says this, this you know, raggedy, burned up thing, maybe the single most important artifact that they have there, is <laughs> it's, it's a Hohokam shirt from Chaco. So the, the deal is that, that we should be looking not for pottery and rocks and stuff like that, because everybody has their own pottery, they have their own rocks, but stuff like cacao, stuff like cloth, you know, the high-end stuff that doesn't preserve, and you know that often doesn't preserve. And this is getting back to the writing: is that maybe maybe they had some system of notation that was on, actually semi-permanent? It's on some medium that we haven't found yet. But by and large, no, it doesn't look like they had writing. But they did this: they did transmit information, coded information with content through line of sight, which is pretty darn close. Um, we aren't so wonderful yet. Um, the question is, you know, are there this, the same sort of thing happened in the Maya, where there was a vision of the Maya of, of philosopher kings, until they started to read the runes and said, "Then I took his head off. Then I took his head off. And I, then I conquered, the, you know, conquered their towns and their women lamented and all that kind of stuff." Um, actually, there, uh, there is a archaeologist who got into what was called the Maya mystique. That's one reason I went from Pueblo mystique to Pueblo space, because there's already this Maya mystique that the Mayanists know about. And when you start looking at regional archaeologies, I mean, they, you know, there are schools of archaeologists that talk to each other and trained. It's not like we, we work in lots of different places. Yeah, they develop their own you know, traditions and conventions and stuff, and stuff like Pueblo Space. And the same, same thing's true in the Mississippi Valley. They don't know what to call it yet, but there's this pervasive bias, and it's a, it's a dogma. It's a dogma among American anthropological archaeology that there were no states north of Mexico. You know, we learned that in Archaeology 101. There's no states north of Mexico. So it's not even worth thinking about, you know, any, any model that would involve like a class society or something like that or a region with a capital. That's not, that, you know, Pueblo Space is over here. That model's way over there. Um, but it is just a dogma. And when people are starting to get past that, Mississippi Valley's a prime case. And who's been to Cahokia? Okay, Cahokia is the biggest pyramid north of Mexico City. All right? But because our Indians did it, and we, you know, American anthropological archaeology has this notion there's no states. It's not a pyramid, it's a mound. <laughs> it's just like any boat an Indian makes is a canoe, you know. <laughs> Even if it's 100 feet long and it has like 80 people in it, you know, which Columbus saw some of those. It's a canoe. All oh, right. Um, Cahokia was a state, and it has been so much fussing trying to get around that. You know, it's just like Chaco. You're trying everything under the sun, like a pilgrimage center or whatever, you know, all these outre sorts of notions when the, the real answer is pretty obvious, <laughs> except for our bias, you know, our dogmas and our bias. Anyway, um, that's a big, yeah, it's a big part of this last book, and I'm sure I'm going to get pasted for it, but it's my last book, so I don't care. 